Thanks very much for showing up. It's, it's really great turnout tonight. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, we're going to sort of do this in a tag team style. So, so basically, um, we're going to question. No. Oh. Tag team. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, so, essentially, we're going to be talking about a collaboration that started three years ago. We could have potentially started this. 25 years ago, back back when our paths nearly crossed, right as I was leaving town to go to grad school, and Lars was coming out here to start his residency. In fact, Lars met John after looking my name up in the LEPSOC directory, talking to my dad. He said, oh, we just left town, but you should talk to John Pelham. And then John kept saying, you got to meet this guy, Lars. He's crazy about Moz, and he really knows his, his stuff. Um, and he does, uh, and, and it wasn't until just a few years ago, as I said, that we actually started working together, and uh, I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe I pushed Lars a little bit into uh, tackling something that he was thinking was a post-retirement project, uh, but the opportunity presented itself, and, and uh, so part of what we're going to talk about today is the results of our working together. We're also going to talk about why moths are great. So if you've got a dirty mind, that's not the answer to that question. Moths is the answer to that question. And we're going to try to convince you of, of such. Bring a so, sound idea. It's much better with the lights down. Can't, can't see the color. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But I can make all kinds of weird faces. The dimmer isn't working, unfortunately. just do this way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's. <laughs> so, so the way that, that we're going to run this talk today is I'm going to introduce moth diversity in comparison to butterfly diversity. Then Lars is going to go into more detail about where and when to find moths and some of the interesting moths that we can find in the Northwest, uh, basically building off of the knowledge that he's built from, from his moth, moth studies. Uh, in the region since he moved out here in 87. And then we'll, what we're, we're going to do is, is illustrate that the moth diversity in this region is crazy when, it compa when compared to butterfly diversity. And so what we've done in collaboration with others is mm -hmm. we've built a website that brings that diversity to the public in a way that makes it a lot more accessible than was, was previously available. And so uh, we're going to be talking about this website that we built, and, and I'll kind of take you on a, on a tour through the functionality of the website, how you can use it uh, to, to identify moths, and also illustrate some of the things that can be learned from mining the data that supports that website. So if you think about the diversity of butterflies in, in the Northwest, uh, and, and, and sort of learning this diversity through your studies, there are a lot of species, and, and it can be sometimes hard to keep track of them because there are so many different species. But let me tell you, compared to moths, that diversity is tiny. Moth diversity is just absolutely incredible, not only in terms of numbers of species, but in terms of sizes of the moths, in terms of their overall body plans. Most butterflies are pretty similar in their overall appearance. Moths are a lot more variable. So on the left here, we have an assortment of different moth species, ranging from the very tiny, these are these little yellow spots here, individual pollen grains. So this is a moth that's maybe a couple, three millimeters long, to something that's obviously, unless that person has really tiny hands, much larger than that. We've got moths that have clear wings, where they have virtually no scales at all. Moths that have no wings at all female tussock moth here uh, calling for a male with pheromones uh, and the male has wings and will fly to, to mate with her and then she'll basically die very near this spot where she had pupated after laying a, a, a batch of eggs. And then we've got moths with these really long slender wings like this plume moth here and if you were to see the hind wings of those they're, they're scooped out so they've got basically finger like lobes <coughs> on the hind wings. So on the right here, we have a, an assortment of butterflies and a skipper. Uh, we, can, we can recognize these as being distinct from the butterflies primarily by looking at their antennae. 
Uh, if you look at the tips of the antennae, there are these clubs on butterfly antennae that moth antennae lack. Moths sometimes have these big feathery antennae. Here's an exception. These are sort of clubbed, but not to the same abrupt degree as in a butterfly club. But most, butter, most moth antennae are long and slender like that or branched like this. <clears throat> Lars will be telling you more about the activities of moths and when you can find them, so that will come into bear when thinking about how we might generally categorize moths and butterflies in our mind and be able to dispel uh, some of the notions that you might have about butterflies and, and moths and their differences. <clears throat> if we think about how these all fit together in the grand tree of life, this is a, a picture that has a lot of small text on it that you do not have to pay any attention to whatsoever because all you really need to pay attention to is what's written over here. So this is basically the tree of Lepidopteran diversity showing the evolutionary relationships among these different groups. The point here, there are really two major points that emerge from this figure. One of those points is that butterflies and skippers are but really one branch in this great bushy diversification of Lepidopteran uh, families and superfamilies. These are moths, all these different lineages up here. These are moths down here. So just in terms of number of different major lineages, there are way more moths than butterflies. The other point to emerge from this figure is that the width of these bars represents the number of species in a particular lineage. So the Noctuoidea, for example, is a very species-rich group of moths. So you can get a sense from that that if you try to add up all these bar widths for moths, that's a really wide overall amount of diversity compared to what we see for butterflies and skippers. And indeed, if you look at a pie chart that expresses the relative numbers of species of North American butterflies and skippers versus moths, this really underscores that, that major point that moths far outstrip butterflies and skippers in overall species richness by more than tenfold. <clears throat> now, within that great diversification of moths, most lepidopterists generally categorize the, the moths in two major groups, and I think this, this Categorization reflect, reflects as much the interests of the moth aficionados as anything, that there are certain people who like to study macro moths and other people that study micro moths, and there's not a, a whole lot of cross fertilization between those groups of people. Um, the tiny moths, the tiny micro moths require different collecting techniques and so on, and, and so it's kind of hard to specialize in, in both. Uh, but on the right here, we have a suite of representatives of different so-called micromoths. These tend to be smaller species of moths, but that's not always the case. This one down here is a carpenter worm moth, which is a rather large moth. It probably has a wingspan of about, yay. Okay. Uh, whereas this is that little tiny guy. Uh, these are, are mostly smaller moths uh, that are rather diverse in, in how they uh, look and also what kinds of things they do for a living. So we've got flower moths, for example, that, that feed on uh, stored grain products. Uh, we've got species that are leaf miners as larvae that develop between the epidermal layers of leaves and complete their <coughs> larval life inside of one leaf. Uh, we've got other species that are leaf rollers that tie together, that roll together leaves. You have uh, family names. Yes. Well, it's most of the study is, them. It's nice to, to get a review there. Sure. So they, this is a, a pyralid in the family Pyralidae. This is in the Nepticulidae. Uh, this one down here is in the Tortricidae. Uh, here we have a pterophorid. This is a plume moth. Here we have an ecophorid. Uh, this one was actually the first moth of this species that was uh, seen alive in North America. And this was it's a, a picture. Or it's, an introduction. it's an introduction from Europe, from Europe where uh, actually in a number of countries it's a species of conservation concern. 
this photo. Who's the guy that found it? Yeah, who was that? That was this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that moth was in my backyard. <laughs> you brought it. This here is in the family Ciciidae. These are uh, stem boring moths for the most part, most of which have a lot of clear on their wings, and, and many of them are rather extraordinary wasps. <clears throat> and this is a carpenter worm moth which bores into wood. So that's this diversity of, of micro moths. On the left here, we have the suite of major macro moths. Groups. And so we're going to spend more time talking about these. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about these because we'll largely be touching on a lot of those. Um, one of the major points here is that the moth diversity is split fairly evenly between macro moths and micro moths. Another thing to keep in mind for later in the talk is that within this great diversity of macro moths, the website that we developed and we launched this summer deals with every single macro moth family in the region except for one, and that's this one here, the inchworm moths, Geometridae. So we'll be adding those in, hopefully, if we get more money to do that, or, uh, or at least more time, hopefully both. Um, so without stealing any of Lars's thunder by talking about any of these groups of macro moths. I'll now turn it over to him. He can talk about where and when we find moths. And then I'll see you again to show you, I'll show you the website. So I'm going to talk a little bit about when, uh, how, and where to find moths. And actually had Meryl come up with this slide. We actually mined the data from our own website for this. We basically just created this bar graph here, the histogram with the number of records that we have in our database uh, compared to when we, when we found these records throughout the year. And you can see that there's basically every month of the year when you can find something out there in the moths. Uh, there's a small bump here in January and December. Obviously, there's a big one in the middle of the summer. You also have to temper the interpretation of this with the fact that a lot more people out here are looking at this time of year. So you can see that. If you go out, there's a chance that you can find moths sometime during the year. So if you go out during the winter time and look at your porch, uh, this little guy might be seen here, that's a, a canker worm. Um, that's the male, the female doesn't fly, she sits on a tree someplace nearby and, and calls for him. If you go out a little bit later in the spring, this is a, a noctuid moth. This is called Orthosia transparens, it's this beautiful red color. This is a fairly common moth in western Oregon and Washington this beautiful crest on its thorax and its antennae are, are tucked away in there. When you're out looking for butterflies in the middle of the summer, amongst all the, uh, the silver spots are these guys that the Albertans call it police car moths. I don't know why, but they do drink a lot of beer up there. It might have something to do with that. <laughs> then when you go out again in the fall, uh, this guy is out there. This, uh, a lot of the fall flying moths in a, in a tribe called Xylonaini are colored the colors of, of uh, drawing leaves. And this is a guy called Mesogona, Mesogona subcupria that I actually named back in the, in the early 90s with Paul Hanna. This, uh, some moths are found all throughout the year. Um, this is um, a common moth called Autographa californica, and I spew Latin like this all night long because I don't really even know the, the common names of these things, so I apologize for that. It's a moth habit. This guy uh, shows up early in the spring, probably uh, partly uh, as migrants from the south, he lays eggs, and we can see that there are several generations through the year, probably as many as three. And if you went to warmer climes, this guy would probably find, be found all throughout the year. But other species are only found during one little part of the year. There might be spring flyers that show up in here. There could be July and August species that show up in here. And there could be fall flying species that only show up in here. And you have to go out during those times of the year in order to find those moths. Um, talk a little bit about day flying moths. Um, a lot of them are found on flowers, uh, which is nice. Um, this is Radip brush, one of the fall flying uh, moth favorites. And this is a really beat up specimen of Ashinia that you often see on those guys, especially late in the day. There are 105 day flying macro moths in the Northwest. And it turns out almost as many as, as butterflies. And, much more interesting, actually. <laughs> um, they tend to be more common in the spring, uh, high on the 
high in the mountains, and especially as you go further north, where there's relatively more day and less night. Like I said before, the late species are often on rabbit brush. And there's a, a suite of non-nectaring day-flying moths, including the tiger moths and giant silkworm moths, like the hemilucas. You can see the big guys that fly around in the middle of summer and late summer. And then there's a bunch that you can find on flowers. Uh, hawk moths, sphinx moths is another name for them. And many noctuids. Um, we talked about flower moths earlier. This is flower with a W <coughs> flower moths. The Tilliophyne. Uh, forester moths, black guy with yellow and, and, and um, white spots on them. And other genera and other groups that are mostly nocturnal, like uh, the little guys named Anaphyla that we'll look at in just a, in a second. Here's uh, some examples of, of day flying moths, and I'm going to go through all this stuff really quickly. The point is not who they are. The, the point really here is to show you the amazing diversity of moths that we have in the Northwest. This guy lives on tops of mountains like Slate Peak. These drasterias are primarily day or sorry night flying moths, but they all have bright penguins like this, and a lot of them are buzzing around during the day as well when we visit flowers. And you can see these out in the desert during a number of different times of the year. This guy is kind of a blue moth that flies here in the western forest. And this little guy is quite small. This scale bar that we see on all of our pictures here is a centimeter. So this guy is only about a centimeter and a half. He flies in the early spring. Here are some more day flying moths. Shinias are these flower moths. Heliotis is another genus of flower moths. These guys are also quite small. You can see here is a centimeter. Uh, we're going to see a habitat photograph for this guy later. This guy is a beautiful, beautiful moth. It's only found along the west coast. There's only a few places in the Pacific Northwest where this is found. Yakima and Klickitat counties are those places. It also occurs further south in California. This little guy, another tiny moth, this lives on rocks up in the lichens on tops of mountains. we are find it in places like Slate Peak and it goes all the way to the Arctic Ocean north from there. And here's our friend Autographic Californica. Uh, primarily nocturnal moth that often flies around during the day. Oftentimes when I see these things, it's a big juicy moth flying around the flowers. I think it's going to be really exciting. This is one of our most common moths. I'm always disappointed when I catch it. But he is quite handsome. So how do we do this? Uh, we're not out during the day. We go to Arizona where this picture was taken. Uh, this is not my picture, but you can certainly put up a, a, a light Moths come to light probably because they navigate with parallel beams that come down from the heavens. When you put a point source someplace, they get confused and they end up coming to it. A lot of people who like to observe moths will put up a sheet like this. It's great because a lot of the moths will land on the sheet and you can take a close look at them. Some people like John Davis, who has talked to this group before, takes pictures of them. And it's wonderful if you don't want to start a collection, which incidentally I think is a great idea for moths, having a collection actually. Because it takes so much to learn them that having a specimen in hand is really helpful. But if you want to, taking pictures is a really good alternative because people can help you figure out what they are by looking at them on the internet. That's not what I do. I use a trap that looks like this. Um, I can put up about 10 or 12 of these traps in a night, go to sleep, and see what Santa brought me in the morning. Uh, this is a five gallon bucket, obviously. It has a poison in there. It has a, a rain drain with a screen on it. This is a funnel with about an inch and a half hole in the middle. Here's the light. These are the veins. And this all folds up and I can put all of these straps in the back of my truck and drive around here and chuck them into different habitats. Here I am at Moses Cooley at Jameson Lake. Uh, rabbit brush. There are things here. There's a couple of these traps set up. And it gets dark. I turn them on. And I go to bed. And then I see what's there in the morning. Works great. So much fun. So much fun that my wife hasn't found with me doing this since 2005. <laughs> uh, here's an alternative that works sometimes in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of noctuid moths, especially like rotting fruit. And you can make something out of, say, rotting bananas, or I think this looks like peaches. If you add a little beer, a little yeast, and a little thyme, this will ferment, and you can slap this on tree trunks. And these moths will come and look, he's, he's, he's drinking the bar. And sometimes these guys can get so drunk that you can just kind of walk up to them, put a jar under them, tap them, and they will fall in. Unfortunately, this does not work very well in the Northwest, except really early in the year, really late in the year, and for some species like these underwings in the middle of the summer. 
What species of guitar player are those? Oh, uh, this, who knows? These, these are, that's probably, this is, this is Eastern stuff. This oh. is, I won't go there. I won't go there. So where can we find moths? These are some of the dots in our database for the Pacific Northwest. Not all of them. And you can see we have been almost everywhere, cumulatively. Some of these dots are mine, some of them are Merrill's, some of them are John Pelham, some of them are other people in the audience. And you can see there's a lot of representation. So you can find moths anywhere you want to look is the basic point. The other interesting part is that there are, certain, there are black holes in our map or white spots on the old maps, terra incognita, where very few people have looked for moths. So if you want to add something, look at our map, and go to these places, put up a light, and find something that nobody's ever found before. Next thing, I'm going to go on a whirlwind tour here. This is going to go really fast. I'm going to go from west to east, and then up north, and I'm going to show you some interesting habitats and some of the moths that live there. One of the themes is that interesting geological and botanical habitats are also often very interesting for moths. This is serpentine soil. Open <coughs> habitats are great for a lot of moths. So you see here there's lots of areas where there are no trees. Here's the, here's the Salish Sea going by. This area has some juniper growing there. This moth feeds on juniper. This is the only spot west of the mountains where that moth has ever been found. So you go looking for the plant, you're going to find something interesting. This is also an east side moth. This is a little uh, teed moth. It rolls up its wings and looks like a little white stick when it's sitting down. And when you spread its wings, it looks like this. These guys are also dry side moths, and they're found in that very special habitat because it resembles a lot of the places that are found east of the mountains. What family did you say the upper left one was? Uh, this guy? Yeah. Um, they've changed everything else. Uh, around now, that used to be an Arcteid moth. I still use the term Arcteid. It's actually Arcteid. It's a subfamily now in the family Arebidae. Mm -hmm. So they've split Noctuids and Arebids and Nolids and Euteleids. So what used to be Noctuids is now four different families. We have references to all these um, checklists and so on where this work has been done on our website. If you want to look at it, you can go there and, and, and try to figure it out. So the recent changes are confusing. You guys are as bad as us. It wasn't me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so here's a place that butterfly collectors love. This is These are some of the gravel outwash uh, prairies in the South Puget Sound region. We've got oaks here before they leafed out. We've got prairie. We've looked for moths here. We found some moths here that like oaks. This is a giant. This is a centimeter. This is an underwing moth called Cacophila ilia. It's got the subspecies named Zoe here on the west coast. This is a smaller moth that's still quite beautiful. This is a tiger moth. And this is a subspecies. The first specimen of this was collected, that I ever saw was collected by John Pelham. It was collected at 13th Division Prairie, but it's also found in places like Miami Mounds. I've since named that um, Olympia as a subspecies name. Old growth, we've got not very much of that, but we do have dense forests. This is okay for moths, but not as good as open places. You know, it's also okay for butterflies. Here are some of the moths that are found there. This green guy flies early in the year, feeds on very ordinary trees like dead fir. Here are two of our northwest <coughs> gems, Autographa speciosa. <coughs> speciosa means beautiful. Polcrata, polcrata means beautiful. <laughs> there, both gems, and they're also very rare. They're found from Vancouver Island, along the west coast all the way down to San Francisco. But they're the most common in places like western Oregon and southwestern Washington. There's a common moth in our area that you can find in your yard in Seattle. Uh, here we get into a specialized habitat, southwestern Oregon. This is serpentine soil again. The white stuff is fog. It's a really, really beautiful area. Uh, a lot of Penstemons there. Penstemons are food plants for a favorite genus of mine called Sympistus. There are two Sympistus that are found in that area and nowhere else in the Pacific Northwest. This guy is quite small, quite beautiful. There's another Musogona. We looked at the other moth that I named in this genus earlier. Uh, Paul Hammond discovered this one at H.J. Andrews Forest down in Oregon. And we'll go, as we go up in the mountains a little bit, here we are at Horse Mountain. We're looking at the Stewart Range in the background. 
These are great places for moths. You got open, dry areas. Here are some of the things that live there. This guy flies during the day. He's a night flyer. Here's one of my favorite genera, Cobalt These moths are generally very yellow or white colored. This one is a soft, powdery green. And this guy lives in the deep forest. You won't find him out in the, in the areas um, with just the low plants. You have to put your trap in the trees to get this guy. As you go a little bit further out, you're still looking at the Stewart Range, but here you are out in the spring. This is May. This is uh, Deer Road. I'm sure lots of you have been there. This is a great place for day flying moths early in the spring. This guy will go buzzing around about two yards off the ground, but slow enough that you can run and catch him. These guys are really quick. You have to walk slowly and you have to spot them off in the distance. Um, if you walk and swing away at butterflies, you will scare these guys off before you ever see them. So you have to train your eye to look a little bit further away, walk a little bit slower, and ignore those butterflies. What, what, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Heresy, I know. <laughs> but they're all quite beautiful. We looked at this one a little bit earlier in this slide. When you go down uh, by the creek itself, this is a great place to look for larger moths. Most of them fly during the night. I've put together a few sphinx moths that you might uh, expect to find in an area like that. This beautiful fuzzy olive green guy with maroon on his hind wings flies very early in the year, probably February and March. Um, these guys are found later in the year. Uh, these guys eat cherry, and this guy eats poplar. This is a huge moth. This is a centimeter again. But they're not that rare, but you have to look for them at night. Let's go. Yep. Oh, just comment if anyone's looking for specimens of those things, they're in a box in the back. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Look at them later. Here we go again. We're, we're out past the Columbia River. It runs past here. This is a place that John Cohen sent me to that has sand blown up in, in between the rocks. This is one of the places in Washington where moths from further south will show up. Desert moths. Here are some examples of those. This beautiful white guy. A lot of them have more foot dirt colors, to use a problem term. But some of them also have intricate patterns and subtle olive colors. They're quite beautiful. This is, I'm calling this Plagiomimicus teferi right now, but it's also an undescribed species. It's very different from teferi, which is a southeastern Arizona and southern California. This is a picture from way down in southern Oregon. We're really getting dry now. This is the old moth mobile. I have a new one that's black. The joke is I'll probably never get a white car again. Uh, here I am in the dunes. These are the mountains in the background. This is one spot where there are a few moths that come from further south that don't get any further north. These are all examples of these moths. They're only found just over the border from Nevada in that part of Oregon. As we go further north into Canada, this is one of my very favorite spots. This is called Lowdown Pass. It's north of Whistler. You can drive to 7,100 feet, which is this saddle right here. And you can walk up if you want, if you're vigorous. And you can put traps all along this rocky road, and you can get all sorts of cool stuff. And during the day, there are day flying moths that fly around the rocks. No butterflies there. No butterfly. I've never seen a butterfly there. Mm -hmm. I'm lying. Here are some of the things you can find there. These are tiger moths. Both of these fly during the day. This guy is up in the rocks. This, way, this one is right where the rocks meets the greenery. This is another moth that I named together with Don LaFontaine, who's one of my heroes from Ottawa, Canada. And here's a moth that Don LaFontaine named. This guy flies there during the day. It's only known from three specimens in the world. Two from there and one from Mount McLean near Lillooet. As you go further north, this is Pink Mountain, really exciting place because you can drive right up there. This is about 6,000 feet in northeastern British Columbia. And there are moths there too. Could you go back for just a second, Ryan? Uh, you can drive up there. Yep, you can. What's the elevation? That's about 6,000 feet. Six, so just don't away. take a hard left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right here, there are a couple of marmots that really, they're annoying, I would say. <laughs> the weather is always bad up here. 
And it's one of those places where you have to get lucky to do really well. And I put traps all along here. This, this rocky slope is really good. Um, right in here, my friend Jim Trowbridge put a trap. He collected one of two known specimens of a really beautiful moth. Actually, this guy right here. Uh, it's two specimens only from northern British Columbia. These guys are both diurnal, they're day flyers. And um, this is a northern moth, it's a subarctic moth that's found from Labrador to Scandinavia, and it gets as far south as Pink Um How are we doing for time? Are we we're okay? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is one of my favorite genera. This is Copoblephron, which means lots of eyelashes in Greek. Um, they, if you look very closely at the eyes, they do have things that look like eyelashes. There are all these beautiful soft greens, yellows, and whites that we talked about earlier. And when I came here, John Pelham sent me to sandy places, and I made a habit of looking at sand dunes for a really long time. And um, together with Don, I named this one, this one, and this one, because the more you look, the more new species showed up. It was really, really exciting time. I'm going to take you to a couple of these sand, sandy places. Um, if you've ever driven up from Vantage on the Grant County side, you go past a DOT site that has big piles of rocks and stuff. Behind those rocks are these naturally occurring beautiful sand dunes. You can see the irrigated fields in the background. Here are some of the moths that were found there. There are a couple of species of copal black sponge. This one is absinum. It's quite common in a number of sandy areas. This one's called Mutans. That's a little joke because we named it from Hanford. <laughs> uh, but it's only found from Hanford to those dunes. It's never been found anywhere else. And when we've looked at interior dunes, it doesn't occur there. It's not at Moses Lake. It's not at Juniper Dunes. It flies for about a week at the end of August and beginning of September. And you have to go out there to find it. There's a Uxoa, there's lots of Uxoas. This guy looks like sand, it's quite variable, but it's found in those sand dunes out there. Here are the dunes at Moses Lake. This is um, a place that some of you might have been. A uh, different suite of moths fly there, including this, the Cobalt Left Line, which looks a lot like that mutants we looked at earlier, but this guy flies in the spring and only in the spring. And when you go to the place where the other guy flies, there are no cobalt left fronts that, like that that fly in this chart. So these are temporally segregated and also geographically segregated, but you, only by 30 miles or so. When you go to the marshes there, here's a guy that pours into the bulrush. Um, this is a guy that eats the peas that grow out of the sand dunes there. This is a guy that lives on the docks that stick up out of the sand dunes. When you go to the beach and look for sand dunes, yeah, there's a couple of left around there too. There's a long story about looking for a guy that was known from a couple of specimens from around Victoria. When I first saw the dunes at Deception Pass State Park, I said, that's where that moth is going to be found. It turns out it's very common there. And we later found out that it eats this plant, yellow sand verbena. And the moths actually burrow down in the sand during the day. They come out at night, they chew a little hole through this epidermis, which is quite waxy and hard. And then they stick their head in, and they start eating large circles like that. And you can actually see these blister marks that they made in the plant. Is that the adult, or you're talking larvae? The, that's the larvae. But the, the adults nectar on those flowers, so they're both coming to that plant. This is that, that moth. It looks a lot like the other ones we looked at, but it's darker, so we call it Cuscum. There are a few other moths that are only found on Pacific sand beaches in Washington and Oregon. Where does it feed again on the plants with lars on it? It eats the leaves. And the leaves. So Can you see the mine? Is it like a mine? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a mine, but it looks like a blister. So some Lycenians make similar blisters on docks. Um, it's, when you get used to seeing them, you can say, yep, that hole was made by that caterpillar. A little hole in the middle, and then a light diamond-sized area around it where there's nothing inside the leaf. And then uh, finally, here's another, that dock that grows out of the sand dunes. This is at, at uh, Moses Lake. There's an undescribed species that, that probably feeds on that plant. We still have about 10 or 12 undescribed moths that I know of right now that live in the Northwest. So plenty of work to be done out there. I just wanted to go over a couple of charts that will help you navigate through our site, which Meryl is going to talk about in a second. A lot of these terms are similar to what you see on a butterfly web, so they will be familiar.
to you. We talked about the cost out of the margin, trailing, trailing margin, you know, angle. I'm going to go fast because these terms are also on our website. And here's a few spots that are very specific to not to in mods. There's a kidney shaped spot that we call the discal or reniform spot, an eye spot called an orbicular spot, and a claviform spot that some species have but not all of them. So kidney, eye, keyhole. Those spots are right here on this specimen, but not clearly as obvious as that, that in that other mod. And there are a number of lines that are really important. If you can see the spots, you can find the lines. So in the middle of the wing is the medium line. Uh, outside the, that is the postmedial. On the other side, the antimedial. And there are spaces on the wing that are named after the lines. Again, this is on the website. Special marks. There's a W mark in some species. That's pretty obvious. And some of them have dashes on various parts of the wing that you can see there. This guy also has a dash, but we didn't put a marker on it. We decided to name some things on the hind wing also. There's a discal spot in some species, but not others. It's post medial line, a marginal band. Um, again, you can take a look at all of this on the side. So, remember how beginning I was talking about how much diversity there is in moths compared to butterflies and Lars just gave you a good sample of a lot of that diversity but still most of the diversity of moths in the region didn't make it in that uh, whirlwind tour. Uh, the website that we have as I said covers all the macro moths except for the inchworms. Collectively it's about 1200 species of moths. So one of my goals has been to try to bring uh, insect identification and distribution information uh, to bring it into a format that's more available to the public. And so that's why I'm working on this insect field guide in the <coughs> Northwest. But I also recognize that the way that people look for information is changing rapidly. My kids tell me that uh, books aren't where you go to find out stuff. Uh, where you're going to find out stuff is the web. Books are for reading for fun. Uh, they're not the source of information. And so, um, you know, somebody who's working on writing a book, that sort of makes me cringe. But at the same time, it also then says that there's an opportunity for other media uh, that would make it possible for people to become uh, more aware of the diversity that's in our area. So with that in mind, I approached Lars about joining forces, uh, the two of us, as well as, as others in the region, to pull together this, this moth website. And, and so at first it was kind of a harebrained idea that I think neither of us thought really would gain any traction, but we thought, sure, what the heck, let's go for it. Let's, let's go to NSF, the National Science Foundation, and see if we can get some money to get this project started. And, and so, uh, we put together a proposal with Rich Zach, who uh, runs the James Entomological Collection at WSU, and sent in this proposal. Got back the word from NSF, sorry, we're not going to be able to fund your project. It sounds like a great thing. And then, I don't know, two months later, a month and a half later, we get an email from NSF saying, we have all this stimulus package money. We're looking for shovel-ready projects, <laughs> and yours looks like it's a good one that we weren't able to fund. Would, would you be willing to have us reconsider our decision? So, okay, yeah. There's a moth on the screen. All yeah. oh, right, that's a micro moth. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a little eager for it. Um, and so, with that, we all of a sudden hit, hit the ground running, and make good on our promises to NSF. And, and uh, this summer, we, we launched the site. Here's the address for it. And ID has set it up so that there's a guest uh, login. So if any, did anybody bring their laptop besides ID? So if you, ID, do you want to get people going on logging in? <coughs> If you, have a, um, if you have a smartphone, we set up the, the website so that it will actually work with, with a smartphone. So most functionality 
uh, is enabled for smartphones. So, some of the things we had to. Try. So we wanted there to. We wanted it to be a tool that would make it easy for people to identify moths despite their diversity, and, and not only so that people could fall in love with moths in the area and realize how great they are, but also to create a tool that would make it possible for. Uh, land managers and ecologists to gather data that might be useful for long-term studies and, and surveys of communities of organisms in their area. And so essentially the, the site, is, we designed it with this sort of modern look. I had a bunch of um, computer science students at Western who were a very talented bunch of those students uh, essentially turn ideas into something that would actually appear on a computer screen because I don't know code and Lars doesn't know code and um, you know, there's a lot of complicated stuff that's going on in the back end of a website like this. Um, but, but basically there are some primary features of the, of the site that are, are up here and they're, they're reprised down here as well. These are the three main functions of the website. Uh, there's ancillary information and I'll point, you, I'll point that to you in a little bit. But if we sort of zoom in, so stay here. We zoom in on those three main functions. We've got species fact sheets, which are basically, you can think of them as being like the species account page in a field guide. Only these are interactive and digital. We have photographic plates, which are like the plate series in a monograph, a, a, a detailed monograph of a particular group. And then we have this identification key, which is not the sort of standard dichotomous key that you might be used to working with, where you are presented with a question and have to make a choice, is it this path or that path, commit to that path, you're presented with another bifurcating choice, and you know the road always splits in two wherever you go. That's a dichotomous key. This key is instead one that takes advantage of the computing power that's available with the website, in that it's a matrix-based key. And so basically this works much like uh, a filtering system might use when, say, shopping on Amazon, where you say, show me electronics, show me electronics that are by the company Sony, uh, and, and basically you put in whatever terms you want, and anything that matches that term will appear. Just like that with us, we've created an identification key where you can choose from any number of different characters, and it will show you all the species that remain that match those characters that you've chosen. Okay, and so we'll, I'll walk you through some examples that show how this works. <clears throat> but again, this site is focused on macro mods, specifically these groups of macro mods. And if we go back here, we can see what the names of those families are if you're interested in the family level names. So we've got the Drapanidae, the Uraniidae, the Lassiocampidae, the Saturniidae, Spingidae, Notodontidae, Erebidae, Euteliidae, Nolidae, and Noctuidae. Say that five times fast. <coughs> <laughs> it's a project that uh, involved us, but also involved a lot of other people and institutions, because basically it's a project built on the collective knowledge of a bunch of moth experts, a bunch of computer whiz kids, um, a bunch of students willing to do the grunt labor in my lab of scoring characters and processing lots and lots of images, and a bunch of institutions willing to open their doors to say to us, yes, you can come into our halls, you can come into our museum and look at our collections and glean data from those collections. And these were the, some of the major players as far as the institutional collaborators go. These two guys were major contributors in terms of content to the website as well. So Lars took the lead on writing the species accounts, but Paul, Paul Hammond here, uh, has done a lot of life history work, especially down in Oregon. And so he has a tremendous amount of knowledge of what certain species eat as larvae, uh, what their habitat preferences are down in Oregon. And so his expertise really complemented that of Lars, who's worked more up in Washington and further north. John, John Shepard, has been databasing moths in collections for a couple of decades now. And so uh, we were able to get him funding <laughs> to be able to continue that process essentially full time uh, for a couple of years. And, and so 
it's, it's kind of a thankless task. He's, he spent hours and hours and hours sorting laws and collections, staring at their labels, entering the information into the computer. Yes? Nobody, nobody in the world better suited for it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's a... Uh, he was young when he started, you can see. Right, that. yeah, he looked like me when he started. Um, yeah, he's an incredibly meticul meticulous fellow. Anal is probably a good description. <laughs> um, but also has this amazing amount of information about old records from the literature, and so he's been adding a lot of those records to the database as well. Plus, He's got a lot of great knowledge about old collecting sites and old habits of old-time collectors. So when he sees a label with some sort of fancy cursive writing on it that's maybe hard for us to read, he says, oh yeah, that's that's so-and-so's handwriting, and this is the site that they would, that this is the site that they, I know this site, and here's the coordinates from that place. This is one of their two houses, and you know, I know which house this mm -hmm. was. So it's just kind of, kind of, kind of ridiculous. And, and, that also, the, the old thing, um, brings another point in, which is that as we're making this change into the digital age of knowledge, uh, the, something that's happening at the same time is kind of troubling, which is that at universities around the country, taxon-based courses are being canceled. It's harder and harder to find courses in entomology, for example. As far as I know, my entomology course at Western is the only entomology course that's taught by tenure track faculty on this side of the Cascades. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a course taught at the University of Washington by a limited term lecturer. Uh, and it's always sort of precarious as to whether or not he's going to be able to teach it again. Uh, a lot of the taxon knowledge resides in folks that are of this demographic. And so my worry is that that knowledge will disappear when folks of this demographic are no longer with us. And so that's another reason to try to convert as much of this stuff into the digital format as possible. By demographic, are you suggesting old farts? <laughs> you use whatever uh, moniker you may should use. Uh, wise ones is another one descriptor. So we've got these three major functions. Um, and I'm going to show you each of these and, and how you can use them and, and talk a little bit about how we went about making these functions work as well. Uh, one of the things that, that you're probably going to be interested in is how we took the photographs because when, when we start to look at the website and see how, the, how high the resolution of these photographs is, uh, it's kind of mind-blowing. I, I still find myself sort of stunned at, at the incredible detail that you can see in the photos. And um, it's all made possible by the super high-end uh, photographic system that was designed by an inventor. He built them in his barn in Virginia. He's an inventor engineer with an entomological background who runs a company called Visionary Digital. And so the NSF grant paid for this, inst this, this instrumentation system, which is basically a, a computer-driven camera lift. So the camera is mounted to this motorized lift. And um, the lighting is incredibly powerful lighting. So these are, uh, they're in, inside of each of these is a 1,000 watt flash. Uh, and so what we can do is shine that light into a reflective umbrella. It comes back through another diffuser. So this is doubly diffused light. And so what ends up happening is all the hot spots that you get from using flash go away. It's just, it's just beautiful, soft light. And, and so you can see high detail. There's so much light um, and so much intensity in the flash that there's no worry about shaking under high magnification, and so the images are really, really crisp at, at high resolution. Yeah. Where's the specimen in all this? The specimen is inside of here. Okay. Yeah. And then for for some specimens, um, Dave is probably talking. You probably talked some about the stacking that you do for photos. So this has the, has the stacking as well. Um, and that's where we can take advantage of the motorized lift. And basically what we can do is for a deep specimen that's you know, like that deep, maybe a, a thick beetle or a really thick moth, uh, we can tell the computer, here's the top, here's the bottom, now go. 
and the, the, the computer takes over, pulls the, the, the camera up to this position, to the top position, takes a picture, a second later it's another picture, another picture, another picture, it just does the whole thing automatically, exports all the images over to this computer, uh, and then we can process them like that. Um, this whole, just to make you sort of quake in your shoes about how much money you can spend on photographic equipment, that setup ran about $50,000. <laughs> But it comes with lenses that allow us to take pictures of anything ranging from the size of an individual scale on a moth's wing, where it can fill the screen, to you know, both of these computers, or this whole, this whole setup and more. Uh, so we've got lenses that allow us to take pictures of herbarium sheets all the way down to microscopic objects. <clears throat> where is it lodged? In my lab. Yeah, lucky me. Yeah, it's a good thing. So, I'm going to take you on a magical mystery tour of the website and all that it has to offer. That's one of the flightless ones, right? <laughs> okay. So, as I said, we've got. Our species fact sheets, our photographic plates, our identification key, those are the main pieces of, of the website that you're going to see when you come to it. Uh, I think probably the easiest way to proceed is, is, is in a way that would mimic what you guys might do, which is you have a moth in hand or a photograph of a moth that you've, you've seen out in nature and you want to be able to identify it. So, the first thing that you'll, you'll want to do is try to figure out, hey, what is this? And then from that, you can then start to learn more about where it lives by reading the species account. But having to just sort of randomly find it amidst a sea of 1,200 moths is kind of daunting. And so I'm going to show you how we can go about doing that. Uh, I'm going to shrink this down the here. Yeah, there's the wingless moth. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify this moth as though we haven't heard Lars tell us what it was. And this one's relatively easy because it is so boldly patterned. Um, what I want to do is show you first something that's really important to remember when you go to the site, which is that this identification key takes a while to load. So I've just clicked it. It gives you this warning as a reminder. At this point, we're just going to sit and let it, do, let it do its thing until the key is ready. It'll look like it's ready. There'll be a little box that looks like it's done. That little box is going to go to completion. It's not done yet. Don't close that box. Just let it do its thing and the box will go away. Okay? If you close that box, you have to start all over again. The reason why it's taking so long is that it's loading up the, the data matrix which is a data matrix of more than a quarter million entries. And it's also loading up the photos that support the key, and there are something like 1,700 photos that are in this key. Uh, Merrill, while we're waiting, does this live, does all this, do all these data live in a server somewhere, or in the cloud, or what? They're all in the server, so we bought a server that's at Western and supported by the server maintenance people at Western. Merrill? Yes. Uh, if you download all this information once, can you turn it on your own computer so that the next time you come to the site, you don't have to go to the again? Unfortunately, it's all uh, done on the host end, uh, all the processing. Yeah. We're, uh, so this, the version of the key software that we produce this with is a, is a uh, free version. We've bought uh, the expensive version and are going to be migrating it over to that. Uh, it's going to be somewhat faster. I'm not yet sure exactly how much faster, but it'll be an improvement. <clears throat> okay, so our key is now loaded, and this is what it looks like. There are basically four panels in this key. The panel up here is the panel of characters. The panel here is the panel of moths that are still possibilities based on the choices that you've made. Panel down here will be for characters that you've selected. And the panel down here is for moths that have been excluded based on the selections that you've made. So right now, if we scroll down through this whole thing, we'd be scrolling down through all 1,200 species 
in the key. Okay. Um, there's a on the on the website. If you go to the home page, there's a, a tab for about the key. So if you forget what I'm telling you, you can go there and it tells you how to use the key. Okay. So one thing we want to do first is under view, activate multimedia icons. And the reason why we do this is that it makes it so that when we figure out what species we have in the based on the remainders that are in the upper right corner, we can click on that species and it'll take us automatically to the species account page for that species. So we click that, and then there are going to be some icons that appear right there. So that, those are the, the species account links. Now, usually for a moth identification, a good thing to do is start with simple stuff. You know where you found it, and you know when you found it. So let's start there. This particular moth, this police car moth, I photographed in western Montana in July. Okay? So we're going to go into here and it asks us in which state or province. So right now, if we click over here, you see there are 1,217 species that are possible. We haven't made any choices yet. Now, if we say, okay, western Montana, because that's part of our Pacific Northwest region, Based on that, we've already knocked it down to 561. Okay? Then it asks, when we did that, it asks, in which ecoregion in western Montana? So you might be thinking, well, I don't know. <laughs> so what we do then is click that and it expands this set of images. And if you're thinking, I can't see those, those are too small, what you do is click on the image and it pulls up the ecoregion map. And then here you can scroll through the different ecoregions and see which one matches. Now in the case of that police car moth, it was this ecoregion. Okay? So we'll select that. And now we're down to 488 species. All we've done is said where we found it. Okay? Then we can say when we found it <coughs> by clicking July. We're down to 443 species in there. Then we can say how big it was. Now we've got rough size categories. If you just saw it flying by or don't didn't have uh, the wherewithal to measure it when you when you encountered it, uh, and so you can pigeonhole it into one of these rough size categories. And this one would be in the large size category. And then once you've made a choice of that, you can go to these more precise sizes and pick one of them if you did have a precise measurement. So in this case, we'll pick this size for that species. But it's length of four wing, right? Length of the four wing, yeah. So that is the length from the base to the tip of the four wing. I just did that so you'd have the opportunity to show us that now. Thank you, sir. Sure. Yes? Uh, the butterflies, we often see the size varying by a factor of two, probably. There can be a lot of variation. It depends on the species. Some are rather uniform. Some vary, I don't know if by a factor of two, but maybe 1.7. I mean, it's yeah, pretty high. Um, and one of the beauties about the key is that you can the, the key can be scored so that multiple characters can apply to a given moth. So you know, like it, just like it can occur in Washington, Oregon, and Montana. It can also be medium and large in size. Okay. So we've made our size choice. We've done nothing about wing shape, wing pattern, wing color, or anything like that. So let's do some of the obvious stuff. This is a black and white moth. Okay? So let's go to four wing color and pattern. And let's pick the main color of the four wing what do you want to call it, black or white? Black. Okay, and the reason why I say that is because, here's another example, we scored it both ways because we, we realized that people might interpret it one way or the other. So, black, and then once we've picked the main color of the four wing as black, we can also add additional major four wing colors, so here we'll add white. We are down to six species. <laughs> At this point, we might just, well, we might just say there it is. But, but we could also click.
click this one and scroll through all the species. Yeah. And notice, so the other two, when we click this one, there's no, there's no other blue arrow here. So this is clicking between species, these double arrows. These are clicking for multiple images within a species. So when you see that, it's a good idea to check those other images within a species. So here's that one with only one image of it. This one has multiple images. So that tells us, oh, there's some variation in the species, but we better check it out. Okay. Those so, are all three different species. <laughs> None of them match our police car moth. That one with the highly high variation within the species. What species was that? This is Panthea virginarius. Here's another one with multiple possibilities. Neither of which match. And here's another one, no multiple possibilities. So why aren't they black? <laughs> we asked to see black ones. Well, yeah, so these are, these are dark enough that we decided to say that somebody might interpret them as black. So if you said dark brown, you'd still end up here. Yes. Okay. Those species wouldn't be eliminated by picking dark brown. Yeah. We tried to err on the side of caution, so, because the main worry was that people would incorrectly rule out the proper species. Right. <laughs> okay, so we've gone through all of them, and the only one that matched was this one. So at this point, we'll say, okay, let's read more about this species, and maybe we can see if there's something else that we should be taking into consideration as a possible similar species. So we click on this. So here's our species account page. Now, the species account page itself has a lot of different features to it. So we've got a photo of the species, we've got a slide carousel where we can swap out photos of that species. So this is the dorsal image, which is the one down here, and this is the ventral image of that same specimen. There's collection information associated with the specimens that was photographed. There's a dot map which shows the, the distribution of all the known specimens that we've run across of this particular species. And there's a seasonality graph based on those collection records. Okay? Um, these data are filterable. So we can actually see just those records from the first half of the 20th century and look at the dots and the seasonality for that, as opposed to the last half of the 20th century. Uh, we can look for just those records from a particular county, or from the Oregon State Arthropod Collection, or in Lars's collection, or uh, that were collected in the month of June. We can do any number of different possible filters and combinations thereof to look at the data. Uh, when we do make choices like that, basically what happens is we then see a subset of the dots and this graph gets updated corresponding to that subset. <coughs> so we can look at, do an elevational filter and say, show us all the dots for 0 to 1,000 feet elevation, and we'll see the seasonality at that elevation. Show us all the dots for 6 to 7,000 feet elevation, and we'll see the seasonality for that elevation. Okay? We can also look at individual data points by clicking on one of those dots, and it tells us everything that we've entered into the database about that particular collection event. It tells us the locality where we found or where somebody found this specimen. If you click this tab, it tells us that Harold Rice collected that specimen, that it is at the Oregon State Arthropod Collection. He collected it on August 6, 1984. And sometimes there are notes like it was reared on a particular host plant or something like that. All that information is entered into the database. How many butterfly or moths did you do this for? We have now, I think, something like 70,000 data records in the database. And many of those records actually represent multiple moths. So if 
there, if Harold Rice had collected, you know, 20 of these at that site on that day, um, they would all be represented by one data point. So these are these are occurrence events, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, especially because the live picture and the pen picture, uh, uh, they'll be in different positions a lot. Do you, do you have many live pictures in the database? We do not yet. Um, I added one just to, as, a, as an experiment because we're just starting to play with that functionality. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is add that, and that's actually one of the things we're hoping that we can put out a plea for here. So we for, can send you yeah. Because what, what, what will happen if, if you send us photos of moths is we can A, confirm the identification for you, B, turn that into a, an occurrence event that shows up as a dot on the map, and C, if you're willing, post your photo in the carousel of photos for that species. Yeah, the carousel includes all the pin stuff that you've already analyzed yeah. and photographed. So yeah. they, you, you could add images of live specimens as yes. well. Yeah, right. and we can also add images of genitalia, larvae. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll do that for you. What's better than butterflies, John? <laughs> and uh, larvae, uh, uh, will you be adding um, uh, yeah, we want to, stages? Yeah, we want to add as much as we can. So, yes, it would be great to add larval images as well. Show the detail on that. Yeah. So, this is a, these images are, are as I said, very, very high resolution. Um, what you can do is if you use this tab right here, we can toggle into the full page view for that image. <clears throat> um, and you can go in even further by using this slider, and you'll watch it comes into focus. So every image is like this. And this is using a piece of software called Zoomify, which basically takes these super high resolution 24 megabyte files and busts them up into a bunch of small JPEGs that represent different degrees of zooming in. And so it will say, okay, you want to go here? We'll go in on this set of JPEGs, or we'll go in on this set of JPEGs. And it makes it take a lot less memory. Also makes it so that people can't just steal our photos from the web and use them for. You know, <laughs> making placemats and mugs and stuff like that. <clears throat> did you, uh, uh, Harold, did you use some of the NSF money to hire undergraduates on work study or something to do a lot of the data entry? Or who did all the uh, keyboarding? So, well, John has done a lot of the keyboarding. Lars has done a lot of keyboarding. Um, and students in my lab and I have also done a lot of that as well. I spent um, probably 50 hours a week for the month leading up to the launch, going through the database in the key, as quarter million entries in the key to make sure that they were as accurate as I could as I could deal with. And you know, I sort of felt like I was in some sort of weird nether world of check boxes, and it was it was kind of a bizarre place to be mentally. Um, yeah, the maps also can go full screen. So if you want, you can zoom in in a particular area. If you want to see it in satellite view to see the land, you can do that. Um, so this is all basically a Google Maps driven interface here. So we take advantage of all the things that that has to offer. Um, and then, you can see that for every species, there's this similar species box, and it tells us that there is one similar species to this one in the region. You might be thinking, well, why didn't that one show up on, in our key? And the reason why is that if we read down here, this species is only likely to be confused with Nophila latipennis, which occurs in western Oregon. Remember, we were in Montana. That's why it didn't occur in our selection. Yeah. And if you had entered small or medium, you might have had the, the foresters come up in yes, similar species. Exactly. Yep. So that's an example of a pretty easy to identify moth. Now let's do something a little more challenging because we can see some more features of the key.
keep that way. It could be a dirt exhaust. A dirty exhaust. Uh, well, how about, is this dirty enough? <laughs> well, no, actually, that's pretty right. Okay, then how about that? Ah, there there you go. Now we get there. Okay. Miller moth. So this thing, check my notes to see where I found that one. That was, oh I should know, it was in my yard. It was in your yard in May. It was in that yard in July. Another no. national record? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. So I cleared the key. How did you clear the key? Press this uh, reset. Re this button up here. Okay. So, my yard is in Bellingham, which is in the state of Washington. In which eco region? It is in the. Sorry. Um, it's this one. Yes, the Puget Lowland eco region. So choose that one. And then we're going to say it was July. And this particular moth had a four wing length of 13 millimeters. So that puts it in the medium category. And within medium, we'll say it was 13 millimeters. Where did the uh, number of potentials go? How many candidates do we have? Ah, so if you click over here, now we're down to 96. Oh, okay. Yeah, you click into the panel to see how many are left. <coughs> okay, so we've knocked it down from 1,200 to 96 based on those choices. Okay. Um, here's where I'm going to show you a feature that, that can be pretty useful sometimes. So this one up here is called Find Best Feature, and that tells us which character is going to be the most useful for dividing the remaining set of species into large groups so we can sort of rule out big chunks all at once. So we'll do that and it says, okay, let's go with main color of four-way. Gray? Okay, we're all seeing this thing. Dirt gray. Dirt gray. Okay. Now, additional major four-wing colors. Dirt gray. Perhaps, perhaps no, other, no other major four-wing colors? There is a bit of lighter gray, but it's still gray. There, you could say, well, there's a teeny bit of black here, but in terms of major colors, it's basically a gray wing, right? It's a gray yeah. moth with some gray highlights and, and the top with gray. It's smeared with dirt. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll say no other major four wing colors. Down to 26. Okay. Right. Now we'll go, what's next best? Okay. Here's where we're going to have to say, well, we have to punt because this is a photograph and we can't see the hind wing. Uh, mm -hmm. Right? So when you can't look at the best, you have a category then, says punt. then this one is find next best, okay. which is okay, I can't do that one, find me another one. Additional major hind wing colors. Punt. Okay? The thorax, or this one says, do the abdomen and thorax clearly differ in color and or pattern? You can sort of see the abdomen in here, but not very well. Maybe not enough to make, make a call on that. Okay? So we'll go... You could actually guess that since there's only two, this is a bifurcatory deal. Can you go back up line on these on these keys? Back, back up one character? Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can go for previous best here. Okay, well, that, that wouldn't hurt then to go ahead and guess, right? On the hind wing? No, on the thorax. So. Oh, we're, we're still here. We haven't, ruled, we haven't gone away from that one yet. So we could say no. We could say this is just a completely dirt gray moth. Or we could say yes, but I don't see any reason for saying yes based on this photo. I'd be inclined to say let's punt on this one. Okay, let's punt. Okay. Fourth yeah, their own yeah. Okay. 
This one says, does the forewing have obvious, distinctly separate orbicular and discal spots? Those are the spots that Lars talked about, the kidney-shaped one and the round one that were near the front margin of the forewing. You, you want to see the discal one. Do you want to remember what those are? Yeah, a bit of a keyhole. Okay, so we've got the, the discal spot and the orbicular spot. The question is, are they obvious and distinctly separate? Let's look at our um, oh, no, no. No. Here's the kidney shape. Yeah, here's the part of the kidney shape one, but it's actually joined to the other one by this spot, so they're not distinctly <coughs> separate. Alright, so we'll have to answer no. Yeah. Somebody backing up. So we'll say no. <laughs> We're down to 23 species. Now, when you get to something like 20, can you just scan through them and say that's it? You can scan through them anytime. You okay. can scan through all 1,200 if you want. It gets easier the smaller the number of species. Another feature that I should point out here is this one here. This is prune redundant features. It's get, this gets rid of all features that are going to be useless for the species that remain. So you don't have to waste your time dealing with characters that are not going to provide you any resolution. So we'll go ahead and do that, just to get, clear out those extraneous characters. Now we'll go back to our find next best. We still are in hindwing characters. Does the moth have hairs on its eyes? I'm sorry, but the photo doesn't really help us with that. That's kind of disgusting. <laughs> do the hindwing veins contrast distinctly with the rest of the wing? We don't see that. Does the forewing fringe have a color and pattern that is distinct from the adjacent part of the wing. So, is it really different? Does it jump out like that? Or does it pretty well blend in with the rest of the wing? Like like wing right? Okay, so that's a no. Now we're down to 22 species. Oh, we got rid of one. Yeah. Hiding discal spot, <laughs> eh, can't really say. Do both the color and pattern of the thorax blend? with the base of the forewing. So, is the thorax and pattern thorax a lot like the base of the forewing, or is it really different from the base of the forewing? It's, yeah. it's pretty much like, right? Yeah. Okay. 21! <laughs> <laughs> we are getting somewhere. <laughs> Find next best feature. Does the forewing have an obvious claviform spot? So that's that keyhole spot here. Yeah, right there. That's what that is. So we'll say yes. Ooh. We can look now. Okay, let's look now. No. <laughs> We've got multiple images here, so we'll look. That was Pencilis. Let's go back one. Back one? Yeah. No. 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 It's closer than what we've seen. Yeah. It's got root. Here's Lacinia Patalis. And here's another image of it. Well, I, I, double. Yeah, I got it. Here's Euxoa atomeris. Here's Euxoa camosa. These are still camosa. That was all one species. Camosa is crazy. And that's it. Okay, let's go back to that one. We, we know what it is. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. It's got this little basal dash. Just like that one does. Yeah. That's it. It's got the nice fused. Lacinopolia, is that what you said? Lacinopolia fatalis. Yeah, it's the first lacinopolia I've ever identified. So then <laughs> we can go to the account and read all about Lacinopolia fatalis and see that, yeah, it's a species that's up in the Bellingham. It's a species that's around in summer. And if we look at the at, for similar species, there aren't any that are going to be really easy to confuse with this one. Okay. 
What does it eat? Yeah. This one eats, let's see, 